welcome everyone. Welcome to our lecture, our artist lecture tonight. I'm Kristen Muller. I'm the director of Peters Valley School of Craft. And tonight we are very fortunate to have the sponsorship of Schiffer Publishing, Schiffer Craft, of um, this lecture with Suhag Shirodkar. And we welcome Suhag from all the way from Bangalore, India. She is a self-taught ceramic artist who specializes in cuerda seca tile technique. After earning her master's degree in pharmacy and management, she worked as a technical writer for life sciences for many years. Suhag was drawn to ceramics from the idea of creating outdoor art. On a trip to Spain and Portugal, she was inspired by all the creative tile art that surrounded the cities, which is what brought her to learn about cuerda seca. Her recent book on the technique is called The Definitive Guide to Cuerda Seca, was a culmination of many years of creating, testing, and experimenting. Suhag conducts workshops in her studio for potters and artists working in other media. Suhag lives in India, where she draws inspiration from India's ancient, medieval, and colonial heritage sites. She also manages her family's ancestral mango farm, which keeps her connected to the rural parts of India. Welcome, Suhag. Thank you. Thank you for that very kind introduction, Kristen. Thank I am you. so delighted to be here among people who love and appreciate the crafts. And you must believe me when I say that because it is right now 4.35 a.m. in India. <laughs> so in today's presentation, I will delve let me share my screen. Is that good, Kristen? Can you all see that? that? And we can see it. It's great. Okay. Um, in today's presentation, I will delve into the history and technique of Cuerda Seca, a unique and indeed marvelous medieval glazing technique. I will also speak a little bit about my journey in ceramics, particularly with this technique the highs and the lows, in the hope that you will see parallels with your own experiences in craft and craftsmanship. During this talk, the chat window will be open. My talk is kind of in four sections, and you can pose your questions anytime. I will try to answer them either at the end of a particular section or chapter, or all at the end of the show. But if we run out of time, Rest assured that I will get to your questions and answer them in the next couple of days. Separately, feel free to reach out to me anytime. My contact information will be provided at the end of this talk. And of course, the Peters Valley School of Craft knows how to reach me anytime. So with that brief overview, let's begin. Cuerda seca is a Spanish term for a ceramic tile glazing technique, which originated in Central Asia in the second half of the 14th century. We don't know what the earliest practitioners of cuerda seca called their new technique. And it is only the later Spanish term that we use today. In cuerda seca, a line pattern is created on a blank fired ceramic tile using an oil-based resist. The spaces between the lines are then filled with glazes of different colors. Since the glazes are water-based and the lines have oil in them, there is a natural resistance. So the resist keeps the glazes apart during application and also when the tile is fired in the kiln. And the final result is a brilliant juxtaposition of differently colored glazes separated by thin dark lines. To understand how empowering and indeed magical was Cuerda Seca when it was first invented, we need to go back several centuries in time. Here you see a mosaic panel from third century Italy. The complete panel was a multi-story installation 
And just this little fragment is six feet tall and about the same wide. It's a port scene with the lighthouse of Alexandria at left and at right, a beautiful merchant ship putting out to sea from the quay. The entire panel is made of tiny squared stone and ceramic tesserae. Now you can just imagine the labor that went into creating an installation of this kind, planning it, conceiving it, planning it, executing it, and then even maintaining it. We're moving ahead about a millennium now to appreciate this mosaic wall from the Alhambra in Granada, Spain. The construction of the Alhambra and its wonderful mosaic walls began in the 13th century and continued for over a hundred years. Here too, you can appreciate the painstaking work that went into mosaic installation. In this case, we have star-shaped tesserae and all manner of polygons that were cut piece by piece for creating this pattern. And then quite amazingly, in the second half of the 14th century, someone or a group of someones discovered a technique which could create the visual impact of mosaic without the pain of it. And here in this slide, you see one of the earliest existing examples of Cuerda Seca. This is a panel high up on a wall of the Bibi Kanum Mosque in Samarkand, a city in modern day Uzbekistan. If you look closely, you'll see it's rather crude. The tile edges don't necessarily match up and the overall effect is a little jagged. But remember, this was designed to be viewed from quite a distance. And so it was the composite effect which mattered rather than the individual tiles. If you're like me, somewhat geographically challenged, Uzbekistan is marked red on this map. And Samarkand, the location of the tile panel we just saw, lies along its southeastern border. Samarkand lay on the ancient Silk Roads, and just by looking at this map, you can tell how, if a good idea originated in Samarkand, it would spread rapidly along the Silk Roads, westward to Iran and Turkey, and all the way southeast to India. And that is exactly what happened with Kuwaita Seca. Here is a photo of the facade of the 14th century Aksaray Palace in Sheri Subs, another city in Uzbekistan, a few hours drive from Samarkand. The palace was built by Timur, perhaps more familiar to you as the legendary Tamerlane. And this is where you see the true power of Kuwaita Seca. Using this new technique, craftsmen could make multicolored tiles with the visual impact of mosaic every color cleanly and clearly demarcated from its neighboring colors. Entire facades like this one could be clad in brilliant color with a speed and ease simply not possible before. And so as every craftsperson in this audience knows, when you find a good tool, you add it to your toolkit. Cuerda Seca became a tool in ceramic artist toolkits across large parts of Asia. This medallion, also executed in Cuerda Seca, is on a wall in the 15th century green tomb in Bursa, Turkey. I want to show you a few more examples just to show you the extent and speed with which this technique spread. Here's a beautiful landscape panel from 17th century Persia, now in the collections of the Met Museum in New York City. It's called Reciting Poetry in a Garden. I'm not sure if it's on permanent display at the museum, but it is certainly viewable online and you can zoom in online to view all the details. 
it depicts what was considered one of the supreme aesthetic pleasures of that time and place, an elaborate picnic with fine porcelain in a beautiful garden accompanied by a reading of poetry. Now, if you look at this detail from another panel of similar provenance, you will understand what I mean about Cuerda Seca becoming one more tool in the Tile Glazer's toolkit. So this is part of a large panel and the background and most of the figures are executed in Cuerda Seca, but details like the hair, and the nose and the eyes and eyebrows or are all rendered with underglaze pigments, a technique similar to myolica. This fragment of Kuerda Sekatile is from Kashmir in Northern India and is contemporary with the murals we saw earlier. You can see that the palette, the glaze palette is somewhat different. It's more primary, more bright, maybe even a little bit garish. And the difference probably reflects local variations in glaze materials and the clay body underneath. Here's another beautiful tile fragment from India depicting an ibex. Now the ibex is not native to India. So very likely the artists who created this tile came from Persia or Central Asia. And here I want to point out that although Kuerda Seca tile was once quite widely installed on medieval Indian monuments, very few examples have survived and almost none of them are undamaged. Centuries of wear, careless restoration and the hot and humid Indian climate have all taken their toll. I'm also hazarding a guess here that the mortar formulations used to install these tiles held up very well in the dry climate of Persia and Central Asia, but were not as suitable for subtropical India. Let us fast forward now to 20th century pre-depression California where Cuerda Seca enjoyed a great blossoming. The railways had opened up the West and large estates and ranches were flourishing. California evoked sun and sea and a lifestyle of ease and Hollywood. The architectural style known as Spanish revival or Spanish colonial revival became hugely popular. And you may recognize the style. Um, it has low tile, roofs, red tile, and stucco facades, and rounded arches. And with this style of architecture, Cuerda Seca was just an absolutely natural embellishment. This is the fountain in the grounds of the Adamson House in Malibu, California. Built originally as a private home, it is now a museum and a designated California historical landmark. It's been called the Taj Mahal of Tile, I would call it the Taj Mahal of Cuerda Seca tile, and is simply marvelous. If you haven't already visited, I strongly suggest you do. Here's a tile floor rug from the Adamson house. Now, I'm not sure it's a great idea to cover high traffic floors with Cuerda Seca. In this case, though, the tiles have lasted well possibly because foot traffic over them is careful and only intermittent. Look at the detail in the floor rug. They even did the fringe or the tassels. So that's your background and context into Cuerda Seca, where it began, where it flourished. It is a technique that has come down to us through the centuries and enjoys great popularity even today. So I'll briefly just ask you any questions here. If anyone has questions, please put them into the chat or into the Q&A. Or you can put the questions in at the end of the lecture. 
Shall I keep going then, Kristen? Oh, there's two questions coming up. Hold okay. on. Uh, Carla Jansen is asking if you will be going over technique. Yes. 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 Okay. I'm just going to step into technique after this set of questions. Okay, and the other question was, I'd like to get the name of the museum home in Malibu that you just spoke about, the Adamson House? Well, it's called the, I think it's called the Adamson House and Museum. It should be easy to search online, um, but I can put a link. If you do Adamson House Malibu, you will hit the website. Okay, and thank you for that. And then did you, an, an anonymous attendee is asking, did this art form travel the Silk Road to China as well? You know, that's a very interesting question. And to the best of my knowledge, it didn't. And China, and again, I'm speaking a little bit outside of my area here. It's interesting because China was just the center from where everything seemed to flow outwards, you know? Mm -hmm. And um, Cuerta Seca did not gain a foothold there, as far as I know. That's interesting, thank you. And then April Press is asking if there'll be a class in this technique at Peters Valley this year. And I'm probably not this year, but hopefully next year. Sounds um, good, that'll be exciting for me as well. It'd be really nice. And then Ellen is asking what kind of glazes did they use? And in that, do you mean were they high temperature, low temperature or lead based? So why don't we take that question along with technique? Okay, because, that sounds good. Uh, yeah, it might, it might raise more questions um, of a similar vein. Let's do that. Perfect, so thank you. I'll move on to the next section. And this is for the hands-on ceramic artists here. And we will only briefly look at technique. Um, we won't go into too many details. If you're interested, you can find the entire process start to finish in my book. And that is available through Amazon and I believe through the Schiffer publishing website. Essentially, you start with a fire terracotta tile. I usually make my own tiles with clay I dig out of a seam at my farm but this is absolutely not necessary. You can either purchase ready-made terracotta bisque, that is fire tile, or you can make your own tile using a terracotta clay body. And my bisque tile, this tile, is fired to cone 04, which is about, I think, 1950 Fahrenheit. Next, I screen print the pattern onto the fire tile using cuerda seca resist paste. You could paint the lines on as well, although painting with a brush is a little bit tricky because the resist loads up on the brush. And hand painted lines are much less likely to be as uniform as the lines you see here. Once the lines are printed, the next step is to pool glazes within the resist lines using a slip trailer for large areas and fine applicators for smaller areas. Glazing cuerda seca is a meditative process. The line, the resist line is actually your friend and it holds the glazes back um, very neatly and elegantly. In this uh, picture, you can actually see how the glaze has dimensionality when it's wet and is being held back by the resist line. And then the glazed tile is fired. Now remember, this is the second firing because the tile was already fired once before the resist lines were printed. And this firing is to a lower temperature. I usually glaze fire to cone 06, which is 1830 Fahrenheit. So there's about 100 degrees, 120 degrees delta between the first bisque firing and the second glaze firing. Now you can see here that although the glazes are opaque, the color of the clay body still impacts the final aesthetic. The tile on left was rolled from a red earthenware clay body 
and the one on right from a white talc body. Of course, glaze colors will pop more on a lighter surface, but a deep red tile, such as the one on the left, provides unmatched depth and appeal for Kurada Seca work. So essentially, this is the process. And like pretty much everything else, it is easy once you know how. I can take questions again. OK, thank you. Uh... Okay, Michelle is asking, I may have missed this already, but what is the makeup of the resist line? Is there a way to use this method with encaustic? Thank you, so glad to be here. Apologies for the lateness. Uh, no, you didn't, you didn't miss anything. Um, the resist paste traditionally has been manganese dioxide with linseed oil and manganese, and I use a flux, a borate flux, just to flux my lines onto the tile, but that not everybody uses that. So the advantage of linseed oil is that it is a drying oil and we use it here for the same reason that oil painters use it, that it dries neatly on the tile within a few hours, within actually half an hour, I would say. And so yes, manganese dioxide with or without a borate flux and suspended in linseed oil, that is the makeup of your resist paste. Now that's the traditional recipe, but you can experiment with other oxides. I've used stains, I've used cobalt oxide, iron oxide, um, but by and large, I do stick with manganese oxides. Did that answer the question? I, I think so. I think that's what they're wondering, the medium. Um, thank you. Julia is asking, how do you screen print the design onto the tile? Do you use special screens? Yes, let me show you that. Okay. And then... Um, sorry, go ahead, Kristen. Uh, well, you're going to show us the special screens because um, I'm sure you're going to go through the process a little bit more. But... One other question is, is it possible to use this technique on mid-range firing like cone five, six, or does the resist paste does not, does it not work at a higher temperature? So let me answer both those questions. And this is just a basic screen. I'm not sure if you can see the design on it, but any, it's, it's a standard printing technique. You, this is a light exposed, exposed screen and the pattern is printed on it. So what happens is that when you push resist through the screen, the area which, was, which holds the pattern allows the resist to go through. That's how you get your line. And this process is kind of tricky with many variables, but I have tried to explain it in my book. So I'm not, in the interest of time, I'm not going to go into too many details about screen printing here. Okay, that's great. Um, and then the question was, you know, do you think that this technique can work in mid-range like comb five, six? I think it can work. I haven't done it myself, except for just playing around a little bit at that temperature. Um, your color range will be narrower. Mm -hmm. And in this technique, we also need some degree of porosity in the tile. So I'm not sure how porous your tile will be at mid-range, but you need the porosity in order to get the glaze to fit to the clay body. Does mm -hmm. that make sense? Yeah, and I was thinking that the viscosity of the glaze, if it gets to, too melty, it might you might have less pure lines, right? It might cross exactly. over. Exactly. In terms of the manganese oxide lines, they will hold at mid-range. They will mm -hmm. hold, um, you know, the that's pretty refractory, but the glazes may kind of jump the line. You'll just mm -hmm. have to experiment with that. Okay, the other question from Sandra is, what design and subjects do you enjoy 
making the most and which ones do you suggest people make if they wanna be more true to Cuerda Seca history? Okay, let's come to that in the next section. Okay, okay. and then, yeah, that's good. Okay, let me keep going then. I'm next going to talk a little bit about my personal journey with Cuerda Seca and how my particular circumstances impacted my craft practice. And the point of it is not so much to speak about myself, but in the hope that you may see some parallels with your own practice and see how constraints and obstacles or simply a new environment or a new set of circumstances can sometimes help to take your craft to the next level. In the winter of the year 2000, so we're going back quite a bit now, when we lived in California, our family made a trip to Spain and Portugal. In India, I'm from a little state called Goa, which used to be a Portuguese colony. And so the architecture and ambience of Southern Iberia appealed greatly to me. I was particularly struck by the lavish use of tile, especially in public spaces. And so when I came back home, my California backyard soon became my ceramics laboratory. Here's a picture from those early days. The mural at left is not Cuerda Seca, but if you can see the wall around the olive tree, that is Cuerda Seca interspersed with mosaic. And in truth, it was super useful to actually be able to freely install the tile I made in my garage because it demonstrated how the tile would take the outdoors. Although we don't have snow in this part of California, we do have night temperatures below freezing and we regularly have winter frost. So it was useful to observe directly what that might or might not do to my Cuerda Seca tile. And here is a mural on my front porch in the same home. This one is of course protected under a roof, but is still subject to the temperature variations of being outdoors. And here I'm happy to report that all the Cuerda Seca in my California home, indoors and outdoors, including murals in the bathrooms, have held up for close to a quarter century now. So if you indeed wish to experiment with this technique, following my process closely should lead to similar success and longevity for your own installations. And then in the summer of 2005, we moved to India. Among our many reasons was the fact that we were homeschooling our twin daughters and thought it would be great for them to live in India and experience a life quite different from suburban California. This is a photograph of the beach near our family's mango farm. Not a soul on it, as you can see. And it was just one of the many lovely places which became easily accessible to us because of living in India. And here is a view of some of our old and gnarly mango trees. Now, although I must admit that I'm trying to tempt you to visit, my main point is that I was now in a very different environment as far as ceramics was concerned. Back then in 2005, and it's a lot different now, you could not easily obtain ready-made clay bodies in India. Bottle glazes were an impossible dream. Electric kilns had to be special ordered and the electrical supply was often erratic. And so the bottom line was that if I wanted to continue making Cuerda Seca tile, I would have to step it up and get into areas that I had not explored before. Fortunately, in India too, just as in California, I could quickly loop into a very helpful and supportive ceramics community. With a lot of shared knowledge and encouragement, I developed my own clay body and glazes, learned to fire a gas kiln for when electricity was unreliable, 
and also learn to repair and maintain the Scut electric kiln, which I had shipped from, from California. This here is one of my early firings using a gas kiln. Although it's reasonable in its own way, it does not have the color consistency I was looking for. For those who know this, gas firing is much more temperamental than is electric, and it takes a lot of effort to get steady and consistent results. With time and effort and a lot of failure in between, the results became much more reproducible. And the net effect was that the lack of ready-made materials, the lack of ready-made glazes and the absence of ready clay bodies had actually deepened and broadened my Puerta Seca practice. Here is a mural I made a few years ago. It's about five feet high and a little over four feet wide. It's an iconic scene of Mumbai, a large city in India. The tower you see in the back called the Rajabai Tower is a fine example of British era buildings in Mumbai. Any resident of Mumbai can relate to this Sunday scene of a cricket game played on the greens with the Rajabai Tower and the court buildings in the background. So I think th that comes to the end of this section and I don't know if that answers the question about inspiration, but I can take questions now. One question that we didn't answer or didn't ask you was uh, an anonymous attendee asking what the percentage of linseed oil to manganese you use? What's, what does it feel it's like? Not off the top of my head, that's the advantage of writing a book. You can forget everything after that. <laughs> but, <laughs> but what I use is a 0.5%, we'll check this in the book, uh, a 0.5% manganese dioxide in linseed oil. The thing is that I have the exact ratio in the book, but I find that I use my senses more than I use an exact formulation. So I start with the exact formulation and then I use my senses to make sure it is right because the viscosity is very important. So I can, um, what I can do is post or connect with this viewer and um, tell them the exact formulation after this presentation. Okay, that's fine. Another question is how do you handle the edges of the tiles? And from another person, is there a varnish finish or some other protectant used for outdoor tiles? So that might be a two in one So the first question. question was about the edges? Yes, how do you handle the edges? Um, you mean, do you not let glaze drip over the edges? The tile is gonna be installed. And so those edges are gonna be concealed within grout. So you're not going to see the edges of the tile unless you want to do something like make coasters um, or not install them. But essentially, you don't glaze the edges of the tile. You just glaze the tile surface. And, and, and just here, so, in yeah. this image here, there is no grout. These are the tiles just laid out before These grout. These are just laid correct? out. <laughs> yes. Yes. Because this, is, this picture was taken before it was installed. Mm -hmm. Okay, and the other question is for outdoor tiles, do you seal them with some sort of finish or protectant? Yes, that's an excellent question. And you really should seal them. Um, I sometimes, to be very careful, seal the tiles twice. Once after they are glazed, are fired when they're ready, and the second time when they are installed. Because you see with cuerda seca tile, there are two sort of weak links. One is the actual resist lines. They don't have glaze on them. And so seepage, or if you're worried about water getting through, I mean, the lines are very fine, but we're hoping the installation lasts for decades. 
And so you have to be concerned about the resist lines. And the second weak link is the grout. So if you can seal your tile installation after it is installed, grouted, finished, you're good. And I've done that with the bathroom installations that I did. I went back and resealed maybe after like five years or so, just to be safe. I don't know if it was necessary, but sealing is important, yes. And one other question related to that is, uh, what type of sealant do you use? What is the name? I'm not sure of the brand of it. It comes from 3M, but there are many, many sealants. If you walk into Home Depot or whatever it is that you have there, Lowe's, um, mm -hmm or a hardware store in India, they will tell you what tile sealant is used in bathrooms or in high traffic areas like kitchen backsplashes. And you can either spray that on or brush it on. Perfect. Okay, and the other question I have is, how do you prepare the tiles and what precautions during bisque do you take to make sure they stay flat? And this is from James. Excellent question. And as any tile maker knows, getting the tile to lay flat and dry flat and fire flat is a challenge. Um, briefly, again, I won't go into details. I describe the process in great and gory detail in my book, <laughs> but essentially you have to make sure that all the tile surfaces are drying at a similar rate. And so I dry my tiles on a grid, on a metal grid like shelving, and make sure that there is an airflow above the tile, below the tile, and around the tile. And that, if your clay body has the right consistency, that is, it, it is groggy. And if you're getting even drying, you will get flat tile with the process I use. Thank you. That's it, if you want to move on. Okay. Thank you. So this next section will also answer the question about inspiration a little bit, okay? And it's about this tile, which you've seen several times already during this talk and also features in my book. And it has a special story that I want to share with you. So in the year 2010, we took a road trip to Mandu, which is an ancient fort city in central India. This is the road we drove up to get there. And along our drive, we came across this ruin. It was set high up on a plateau and commanded a panoramic view of the plains. And there wasn't a soul around. Outside the ruin was a historical marker. And it told us that this ruin was called Chishti Khan's palace. And let me read what this marker says because it's quite a bit worn itself. This palace built in the 16th century as a retreat for the rainy season is much decayed. The main wing in the South consists of a rectangular hall with a room at each end. There is a Persian inscription making a poignant reference to the desolation of the surroundings. We got out and gingerly walked into a dome chamber. It was dark and damp inside and smelled strongly of bats. When our eyes adjusted to the light, we noticed specks of color high up on the inside of the dome. There were ghost outlines of patterns and fragments of glazed tile. It soon became clear that this dark, smelly room must once have been a resplendent chamber with brilliant wall murals and ceramic tiles. I'm not sure if you can see what I'm talking about. I've circled the areas in orange but I'm happy to share this photo later with anyone who wants a closer look. In any case, we took photos at the highest resolution our little camera would afford 
and left with a sense of sadness, imagining what this ruin would once have been. Back home, piecing together all those grainy photos, I recreated the ghost pattern which was running along the inside of the dome. Here is the line drawing. And here is my first tile made in the pattern. I tried to approximate the original, both in terms of glaze colors and the underlying clay. It's now 13 years since I visited that ruin and quite likely those few vestiges of color and glaze and pattern are now gone. So it's a little bit of a comfort that this absolutely gorgeous Cuerda Seca pattern could be salvaged and kept alive for the future. Any questions about this? Let me check. Uh, I don't think so. So that brings us kind of towards the end. I hope you've enjoyed this talk and that you can take away some learning or some inspiration from my experiences with this wonderful tile, which has come down to us, to us through the centuries. I want to close by thanking just a few of the many, many people who have accompanied me on this Cuerda Seca journey. At the Tile Heritage Foundation in California, Joe Taylor and Sheila Menzies. At RTK Studios in Ojai, California, Richard Keat and Mary Kennedy. And in India, a wonderful artist who is no more, good friend to people and animals alike, Leela Bospovar. And thanks finally to the Peters Valley School of Craft. Thank you, Rachel. Thank you, Kristen. You've been so good about organizing this. And I hope to visit soon. And of course, thanks to you all. This is my contact information. Please reach out freely. I'm very happy to help in any way I can. Thank you. Thank you so much, Suhag. You have a few more comments and questions here. Um, Julia Albison says, not a question, but what a beautiful story. Um, and then Michelle. Thank you, Julia. Oh, hold on. And then Ellen says, I would like to know about the glazes. Are they special? Yes. So about the glazes, with Cuerda Seca, you can be anywhere on the spectrum of how much you want to get into your glazes. So you can start with ready bottle glazes that fire at cone 06. Um, remember the big mural I showed you with the cricket game? That was done with Duncan and Vision glazes. Ready bottled, easy, a little more expensive, but it's that was fine for that project. Um, if you wanted to get a little bit more Along the glaze journey, you could start with a ready fritted glaze and add mason stains or other stains. And I have recipes for that in my book. And then of course, if you want to go all the way, you can work with a fritted base glaze and create your own pigments. So it kind of depends where you want to be on the glaze spectrum, but the easiest way to get into Cuerda Seca because you're already dealing with a lot of other factors, your printing and your resist and all this other stuff, I would suggest if you want to experiment, start with bottle glazes. And then as you get more comfortable, then move on along the glaze path. Thank you. A couple more things. Uh, such a wonderful talk and slides. Thank you. Also, I wanna thank you so much for this talk. It was very interesting and inspiring. I particularly appreciate how you've used your knowledge to preserve lost history. Then Sandra says, thank you very much for sharing this ancient method with us, Suhag. Love the cricket match mural design. Uh, Carla says, great. I had no idea about this before. Thank you so much. 
thank you for the interesting presentation. What is the title of your book? The book is called The Definitive Guide to Kuwaita Sekatai. And you can and find it. It's on Amazon, yes. And it's also on the Schiffer Publishing website. Yes. And I looked it up today, so it's there. It's easy to find. Just put <laughs> Cuerda Seca and you come up. So it's Wonderful. great. Um, then Ellen says, I was blown away by the tile installations in Southern Spain and Portugal. Thank you for this intro to the history and process. Um, and then someone, Susan Francisco. Hi, Susan says, I like how your blouse reflects the tiles, the beautiful oh. pattern. <laughs> And uh, Judy, Judith Felston wants to know what size tile do you find easiest to work with? Small, medium, large? It's a good question. Um, the tile size I'm most comfortable with is a six inch square or a six inch about that. But I do work smaller and bigger. The smallest I've gone is about two inches. And of course, at that size, the line pattern will be very simple. And the largest has been about a foot square. So the constraint will not be so much on whether you can do cuerda seca on the tile, but getting the tile to be flat. Right, yeah. Well, I have to say, after watching the fellows in, Mar in Morocco, chiseling the pieces to make the mosaic, the cuerda seca would seem so much easier, but it also must be a little fussy to, to try a lot of experimentation to get all the control that you have. Um, yes. And it's beautiful. And so many people are thanking you and telling you how beautiful it is. Um, uh, one question is, does this technique work on functional work, which makes me think vertical forms uh, or is it better to keep it on flat forms? I've always kept it flat. Mm. And the most curvature, I've once in a while done a platter with a little curve, but essentially I make tile. Now at the Adamson house in California, outside the main doorway are two large planters with cuerda seca. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting that they did those planters and I've always been puzzled as to how they fired them. If you look closely, the glazes do run at some places, but they don't run as much as you would think. So if you ever wanted to experiment, you could still do it on tile and place it like at a 45 degree angle in your kiln and see if your glazes run. Um, I think, this technique is more suited for tile and installation rather than any surface on which you would have food, just because of the porosity of it, the manganese dioxide, the, you know, and um, yeah, yeah. So essentially it's a, it's a tile technique. Thank you for that. Thank you so much, Suhag, and thank you for inviting people to reach out to you. Um, for those of you who enjoyed this and want, may wanna share, this presentation with others. It will be posted on YouTube. We have a YouTube channel that lists all of our lectures um, so you can enjoy them a second time around or share them with others. And we thank Schiffer Publishing so much. Um, they are a wonderful publisher of books on craft um, and they have a great uh, library or bibliography of books and titles. And thank you, Suhag, for sharing your Cuerda Seca story. Just fascinating. And as a ceramic artist, I really did not know about the resist technique and I will pay much more attention um, in the future to those ancient tiles. Thank you so much. Wonderful, and, thank you so much. It's been a pleasure. And thank you, Rachel, for being our amazing technician and to all of the audience that showed up. I see a lot of friends and uh, familiar names. So thank you so much for joining us and have a wonderful evening. And you have a wonderful day because you're just beginning as we're ending. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye-bye. Hello, and thank you so much for watching this program.
Peters Valley would like to thank its sponsors for making programs like this possible. If you liked this video, please hit the like button and subscribe to Peters Valley's channel to receive more like it in the future.